Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm Sandy Mason with the University of Illinois Extension as the State Master Gardener Coordinator, and we are so glad you've decided to join us. And baby, it is cold outside, but we all know it's the perfect time to be thinking about gardening, planning for your gardening season. Maybe you have some questions about what you can grow, or maybe you're thinking about pruning things. Well, Mid-American Gardener is your chance to get some answers to your questions. And we always have an ever-changing cast of characters uh, every show, and tonight is no different. Maybe more character tonight than usual. I don't know. Anyway, so uh, so Chuck, why don't you introduce yourself? Character, right. character number one. Yes, character number one. <laughs> I am Chuck Voigt. Uh, I retired from the Department of Crop Sciences here on, on the Illinois campus. Uh, my specialties were vegetables and herbs, but I can answer questions throughout horticulture pretty much if, if, if forced to do so. <laughs> um, okay. Tonight I have a, a, a good question. It's from Maxine, and it came in just this, just this week. Uh, are Brussels sprouts and cabbage sprouts the same or two different vegetables? Well. I had to look up cabbage sprouts because I, it, it's like a new terminology that I hadn't heard. But all it is, all cabbage sprouts are, is when you harvest a head of cabbage, there are little buds around the bottom. And good gardeners, and all the gardeners that I've taught over the years know that if you just keep the plant healthy and keep the insects and diseases off of it, those sprouts will grow. And you get little two inch wide by maybe four or five inch tall new heads of cabbage, which apparently are even sweeter and nicer than, than the others, and marketers have finally given it a name <laughs> so that they can push it. It's like we talked before about Chinese gooseberries never sold, but when Frida in California started calling them kiwi fruit, they went crazy. So <laughs> it's like that. <clears throat> Brussels sprouts, <clears throat> although it's the same species as cabbage and broccoli and all those other things, is, is a, separate, a separate item. And then the other thing that I thought I might as well talk about because I've been hearing about it on some of the English uh, allotment blogs and things are flower sprouts, hmm. which is a cross <clears throat> between kale and Brussels sprouts. And so instead of hard little heads all the way down the stem, you get these little loose leaf kales all down the stems. And supposedly they don't have the bitterness of, of either kale or Brussels sprouts. And so they're very nice. Uh, you'd probably grow them the same way you would Brussels sprouts, start the seed in June, transplant them in July, and then keep them well watered and f free of insects and let them mature in the cool of the fall. And uh, then you'd have a whole stock full of these cute little, like little tiny flowering kales. What a great idea. The so, and then probably the big thing is just knowing when to plant them, because these are really, these are cool season crops, but then really understanding, that's why right. it's always good to do a little homework, find out. Because inevitably going? they'll probably have plants for them in March. Yeah, which isn't and, necessarily and, and the time. that's not good. They, yeah. they, they just keep getting taller. Mm -hmm. And you have with to Brussels do- With Brussels sprouts, right. Mm -hmm. Brussels sprouts, and I'm sure with flower sprouts right. will do the same thing. And you have to do insect right. and disease control from March <laughs> until, <laughs> until November that way, where if you, if, if you start them in, in June, it's like July into November. Okay, okay good to know. <coughs> I, I love fall gardening too, so that's a great oh, idea. Thank you I very do much. Too. And Marty. Sure, thank you. Uh, the things you learn. I didn't know that. Anyway, that's why I'm here. My name is Marty Alanya. I'm a private landscaper, and I prefer perennials and shrubs and trees, but that's why we have Chuck. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll grow vegetables if you pay me. Anyway, um, our question here <laughs> is about ground ivy, otherwise known as Creeping Charlie. No offense. Um, creeping Charlie, everybody has a problem with this. Everybody, the garden's in mid, West, the United States has trouble with Creeping Charlie. The problem with Creeping Charlie is it's pernicious. <laughs> it's very hardy and it grows everywhere. It'll grow in full sun, it'll grow in shade. Typically the problem you have with lawns in shade, is, when Creeping Charlie in lawns, is that it's in shade. The more sun in a lawn, usually the less trouble you have with it but it will infiltrate your perennial beds. It'll climb up, you know, everywhere. Um, you can pull it by hand. It's no fun, but you can do it. I would recommend trying to do that after a deep watering or a big thunderstorm. It's very cathartic. You pull them out and you hear the little <laughs> screams, you put them in the basket. It's fabulous. Um, if, you have a, if you have it growing in a lawn or in a bed of grasses, or you can use a spray that's specifically for broadleaves and not 
broad spectrum that does broad leaves only and not grasses, go to your local garden center and ask okay. for that Great. specifically. Okay, very good. And actually, I, I know I've mentioned this before, but I actually kind of like Creeping Charlie. I mm -hmm. mean, it's really, it does make a nice ground cover in certain areas. I don't like it in my strawberry beds and stuff, so uh, there is that yeah. end of it. So, yeah. you know, sometimes people just learn to live with it, right? I was so. just, I was just <clears throat> writing a paper about hops for Herb of the Year this year, <laughs> and, and ground ivy was actually used as a bittering agent in beer and ale <laughs> Good before, to know. Be, before <laughs> hops came into general usage. So it uh, has a use too, so that's good. <coughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. want it to taste and good. Jennifer, uh, and good. Jennifer, do you have some fun I, stuff for us? I think we could do a whole show on Creeping Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> we probably, probably yeah, could. Very familiar could. with it. I had to pull <laughs> yeah. it half of my oh, life yeah. at home. I'm Jennifer Nelson and I'm a horticulturalist and I write a blog called Grounded and Growing and my favorite things are, well, general horticulture, kind of like Chuck, but I also like vegetables and houseplants and so, you know, bring us your questions. Um, today I've got an email from a viewer. Uh, she has a question about her jade plant. She wants to know what's happening with it. She's had it for 10 years and it thrived in a south-facing window for uh, longer than that and during last year she, it started losing leaves and she wanted to, was thinking that maybe I need to repot it so sh it was like three plants so she separated it used the soil formulated for succulents and two of the three are still dropping leaves not as many and she's wondering what in the world she's doing wrong because she's been watering the plant once a week and it was thriving until she divided them so what can she do um, I would say for a jade plant, watering once a week is awfully lo a lot of water. It is a succulent and they can go for a long time without being watered, especially in the winter months when they're pretty well dormant. I will say I've got a couple jade plants and I've watered them maybe twice this winter, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe you shouldn't do them as infrequently as I'm doing, but um, the losing leaves is a sign though that it's probably being overwatered. And the fact that she took it in one pot and divided it out to three there's a lot of soil that doesn't have roots in it so it's mm -hmm. staying wet and that's going to just encourage mm -hmm. the the rotting and the the leaf drop and also as jade matures the stem tends to get almost a woody look and it will naturally lose some of its lower leaves mm -hmm. so you may have a combination of, of those two things okay. going on but okay very good got it. normally it's one that maybe she's loving it to death Maybe yes, sometimes, sometimes we is. love our plants to death. I think that's part of it. So great. Are you recommending and scientific neglect? <laughs> scientific neglect. <laughs> Benign that's always a good neglect. One. Benign <laughs> neglect. Uh, one of the things that I think lo I love this time of year is we love having indoor plants and stuff. But I, you know, especially when we start getting around uh, February and Valentine's Day, are these potted uh, miniature roses that are available now? Mm -hmm. I, they're wonderful as indoor plants. So you can give them as gifts or give them to gift to yourself. Give yourself one. Uh, and the nice thing is they will bloom and bloom, bloom their little hearts out, and then come I usually wait until May mm -hmm. um, and then I go ahead and go ahead and plant them outdoors there they can live outdoors they're very hardy and you can have each year each mm -hmm. Valentine's Day mm -hmm. you can get another one you could have a whole uh, rose garden just by years and years and years so they're wonderful plants people don't always realize that you can plant them outdoors mm -hmm. so I think that's the other good thing so so enjoy and you know give yourself they're, a gift they that's do what I say wonderfully. yeah they're, they're very they're hardy and I love the miniature footprint. roses they're much hardier than yeah. some of the other plants two so. or three feet tall yeah. maybe and maybe half as wide and they they just bloom and bloom. Okay, super. Okay, and on uh, line four, we have, we're going to go to our callers. On line four, we have Chris from Muhammad, and you have some questions about growing tomatoes in plastic bags. What's your question? Hi. I, uh -huh. I have a question about, I saw these big plastic bags that you could use to plant tomatoes in and like, set them on your patio, and they would drain, and you wouldn't have to worry about them, but they were about maybe two and a half feet tall, and these people, um, did you have any idea about them? At growing tomatoes in bags? Well, <clears throat> the only thing I heard that's not true is you do have to worry about them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because yes. anytime you Good put point. anything in a container, right. it becomes, the maintenance becomes much more difficult, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. easier. Right. So you can probably grow tomatoes in them, if, if especially if you don't have access to a uh, a garden where you could put them, but um, I don't know that a plastic bag is, is necessarily better than a, a big pot or, right. or something right. else that yeah. has good drainage. Yeah. Just uh, you know, a, a really good soil mix in it, uh, probably fertilize them fairly regularly, but not too heavily at any one time. Uh, give them full sun mm -hmm. and keep after them right. with the watering because 
it's 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 going to be more difficult. And if if they're kind of enclosed in a plastic bag, it becomes a little more difficult to to figure out when they're dried out. Right. Yeah. So probably not the best way. But I sometimes I've seen that where people just buy a giant bag of you know potting soil mm -hmm. and they they rip it open and then basically just plant <coughs> right into it. So sometimes I think people see, feel like it's easier, but probably maybe smaller crops like lettuce and some of those might be a little bit better than tomatoes necessarily. Or, or like a, a pixie or a patio tomato, patio in, tomato in, in a container works much yeah. better than trying Small to grow one. trying to grow big beef yep. steaks yep. in those. Yeah, yep. good idea. It's always fun to try something new though, right? I don't, <coughs> I I don't know what kind of plastic bag you're you're talking about, but what I find is that depending on what it's made of, I know it's designed for this, but a typical plastic bag if you put it in the sun where the it tomato needs down. the light, the plastic breaks down and then it breaks yeah, and the soil rain. goes all good over. Point. It's okay. a mess. I think the ones they sell for this are kind of reinforced and, yeah. and not and not a, a quickly degradable polyethylene, I don't think. Okay. okay. Fun, it's fun to try something new. <coughs> anyway, uh, I did want to mention that last week, you know, we did mention that we're having a brand new podcast joining our Mid American Gardener family. I'm excited to announce that former longtime host and permanent friend of the show, Diane Nolan, is the podcast's first guest. Yay. We love having Diane back. She loves talking about getting ready for spring, planting and planting the vegetable garden, maybe floating row covers, crop rotation, perennials, mulching, vegetables, you name it. If you have questions about these topics for her, uh, get them in as soon as possible by email at yourgarden.gmail.com or message us on Facebook. Just search for Mid-American Gardener. The first episode of Mid-American Gardener podcast will be available for download or streaming on Thursday, February 8th via our website at midamericangardener.org and will be available via iTunes on that day as well. Give it a listen and let us know what you think. And we love having Diane back. We know she has that passion for gardening that we love to hear about and I'm so glad she's going to be part of that, and I'm sure you all too are oh, yeah. too, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, very good. And we're going to go back to our callers. We have Steve from Bloomington, and you have a question about uh, hydrangeas? Uh, line two, Steve? You have a do question? you recommend anything that I can do to big leaf hydrangeas to help them overwinter more successfully, maybe to get more bloom? Yeah, big leaf hydrangeas. We get a lot of questions oh, about those, don't we? If we had a nickel for every yeah. time yeah. someone yeah. has so How do you get them through the winter? Yes. What do you think? There, some people will try to wrap them in burlap. Mm -hmm. I have never been that ambitious, but the I, newer varieties mm -hmm. will bloom on new wood. Exactly. If you have the old ones, um, they're going to only bloom on, on old wood, and then if they freeze in the winter, mm -hmm. then you don't get any blooms the next year. The newer varieties bloom on old and new wood, so you have a little more going for you there. If you do, I have done this. Um, get some stakes, put them in the ground, get some yards, yardage of burlap, wrap it a couple times around, leave it open at the top, but try to get it as tall as the plant or at least two-thirds as tall as the plant. If you're keeping wind off of it, um, pray for snow. <laughs> that really helps. Mulch really well. Uh, make sure they're moist enough in the fall. Don't let them dry out just because it's cool and you think it's it's uh, wet enough. Sometimes when it's dry in the fall, it is not. And I don't think people always realize that there's different species of hydrangeas. Mm -hmm. and oh, that's lots. the That's yeah. the really the tough thing, especially that, that big leaf hydrangea, that macrophylla, hydrangea mm -hmm. macrophylla, that's really a tough one to get through mm -hmm. the winter time. It is. Um, and so it's a tough one to get to flower. So if you get some of the other ones, like the arborescence, which is, you know, like the oh, an, yeah. there's like some Annabelle's, but there's like pink Annabelle's. And oh, so paniculata. Really, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, paniculata and uh, the arborescence yep. are the, the two to look yeah. for. And I know that sounds like those big words, but it is one of those things that really, you know, pick the right cultivar makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? Yeah, the big dude. leaves are just prima donnas. Yeah, the big leaves are prima donnas. We're we're not here for prima donnas, are <laughs> do, we? You know, do <laughs> we a little like research, okay, Steve. You know, and, and just look up you know different kinds of hydrangeas. Yeah. That you might you might find. Dang, this is more work than I want to do, and <laughs> get something different. Yeah. Yes, we always want something different. Oak, oak leaf and is, on, is pretty too. Oh, Kirks are great. Yeah, yeah. oak leaf is really yep. good too. They That's are another one too. So good. Uh, and on line five, we have uh, Venus from Decatur, and you have a problem with the lilac. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have the lilac for about several years, and it, when the first time I planted it, it plenty of bloom. Now it doesn't bloom hardly, but it's tall, about six or seven feet tall now, and I have not wow. cut it down. Wow. So it sounds like it's growing well. So why wouldn't it bloom a lilac? My first idea was that you were pruning no. it, but if you're not pruning it, <laughs> my goodness. 
Has anything about the location changed as it's gone from being really sunny to really shady? Because sometimes if lilac are not in enough sun, they don't bloom very well. It's kind of a next to the, uh, what you call it, cedar tree. Mm -hmm. Oh, a cedar tree? Oh, oh I wonder if it's getting a lot of shade. Yeah, if it's in too much shade, that will affect the, the ability to yeah. flower. Yeah, so sometimes that's a really tough one. So yeah. yeah, yeah, so you might think about, you know, I don't know, maybe think about moving it. I don't know, that yeah. might be a tough call. Or maybe try another lilac in another location. That might be a good one, so. Yeah, you could also, that. of course, try fertilizing it with a high phosphorus fertilizer. The, the three numbers on the bag of fertilizer, the one in the middle is phosphorus, and that encourages bloom. Okay. So you might try something like that, some bone meal, you know. Okay. See, see what happens there, that couldn't hurt, might okay. help. Cricket? And Peggy, I think you have a great question for this time of year. And you have a question about cutting roses on line three. It's like the one you have on the table. Oh, just and <laughs> <laughs> It's got real tall, and she's wanting to know when she can cut it back and how much she can cut back on it. Okay, very good. When to cut roses. Uh, Out outdoor roses. Not in, like not the like the... It looks like the one you have right, on but the table. Out, but right, it's but it's outdoors. But right. it's out in the yard. Right. Okay. Okay. Spring. Yeah. Yeah. I usually don't prune roses until they're, uh, they're starting to break. Mm -hmm. Still, they come out of dormancy and we call them breaking. When you start to see little mouse ear leaves coming off of them, that way, if you had some cold die back from winter, then you know where the cold died back to. If you don't get any die back and you want to just prune it for shape, that's the time to do that as well. Take out any older wood, take out any spindly wood, reduce it by maybe a third if it's getting too large. Because it is one of those things that sometimes even these miniature roses, yeah. even though the flower is miniature, sometimes the plant can actually get some pretty good size. Yeah. And actually even things like knockout going. roses and some of oh, those really get, get some, they, they get crazy get big, big yeah. if you let them go too much. Yeah, so. so you can cut them, you know, especially shrub roses, like for instance knockouts, you can cut them pretty pretty harshly and they'll, they'll come back. But, you know, just typically a third of the wood at a time is about all you want to take out. So that's a good one to, to kind of wait on, maybe roses. Oh, and, yeah. You know, we I talked about butterfly yeah. bush, maybe waiting on that. But is yeah. there something that people could actually prune right now when it's this cold? We pruned a, a viburnum at home that was just mm -hmm. something we'd been meaning to do and took some of the bigger branches out and just did some shaping uh, last weekend. Yeah, you, uh, you can do some, if you have yew or boxwood you want to shape, you can do that right now. Evergreen, you know, like evergreen hedges or anything like that. Um, you can do aronia, you can do... Yeah, grapes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Time yes. for grapes? Yes, grapes. Um, anything that flowers in the spring, don't cut that now. You're cutting off your flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't kill it though, but no. you will sacrifice right. flowers. True. Yeah, it, yeah, true. But if, you, you know, if you're only growing that specifically for a bloom in the spring, mm -hmm. don't cut it now. Cut it right after it blooms. You can also uh, prune trees like uh, ornamental trees right now. Sure. And I know they do, <laughs> I just said, don't <laughs> prune them until after you bloom. But Right now, without the leaves on, you can see the structure mm -hmm. of the tree better. You can take out whips and dead branches and that kind of thing. It's good Prune therapy. It yeah. And oh. When you get cabin fever and it's you're just so dying nice to get out to there get and out. do something, it's mm -hmm. really, really you good. You can cut off ornamental grasses right now. Yeah. Might be a little bit grasses. early, but you can yeah. still do it. You know, take it. It's not going to hurt it. And people may not realize also, you know, if you, you cut a few of your like crab apples and some of those, mm -hmm. that actually they'll go ahead and, you know, bring them inside. Mm -hmm. They'll actually go ahead and flower. Yeah. You know, they're, they're not going to live, right. you know, they're going to live forever, but it's like a cut flower then. Yeah. Sure. Which is yeah. pretty oh, cool. Cornelia yeah. cherry dogwood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, that one does, they're so pretty. It's really, really easy. They're so pretty. It's that cherry yellow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything. Or anything. Or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Make it through the winter, right? Mm -hmm. We're all ready for that. So what kinds of things, you know, we were talking about starting different, you know, vegetable crops or whatever. Are there other things that maybe people could think about actually starting? Starting seedlings or anything along those lines. You I try to thinking about doing. Uh, well, yeah. Well, I, well, like Chuck said, it is kind of early mm -hmm. for any other kind of a seed. Uh, the only other thing I would think is if you're doing poblano peppers, poblanos, they're big, <laughs> you know, and they get they have a lot of structure. I mean, they're almost like a small tree, and they have a long, long growing season. So you might start them, but even. The first of February is even a little early for them, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. Maybe more like the end of February, you know, earlier than tomatoes maybe. But you can put those in the ground when they, you'll have to transplant them, but you can put them in the ground when they're in a bigger pot because they take a yeah. lot of growth. I mean, but, ooh, 
the payoff. Yeah. yeah. So maybe yeah. Er some herbs or anything? Yeah. Like even H habanero some pepper as well, right? Oh, Peppers yeah, develop they take really a long slowly time. from seed as yes, well. Yes, they do. Uh, sure. Um, some of the cool weather things, so chives you could get going. Mm -hmm. um, um, I don't know, sage maybe if you get started. How about something out of the vegetable bin? Could you like <laughs> your, your garlic, maybe? <laughs> Any of those kind of things. That's that easy sure. to do. If, if you have, if you have, some, if you have some garlic okay. that's sprouting but anyway, you, yeah. you, you could pot that up and, yeah. and have, have some, some green garlic uh, <laughs> scallions in a pot just very quickly. It's, it's milder and sweeter, and, and it's really kind of fun to use. Oh, okay. they are, and the scapes are good. I mean, okay. Okay. they're good. Very good. So lots, lots of good things. So thank you all very much. And I think we just have a few more minutes, but is there any other kinds of things that you guys are really thinking about or excited about doing any, anything yet this year or uh, new plants or any of those good things? I've been out work, we, working on uh, weedy shrubs. The, the Amur honeysuckle and, and uh, mm -hmm. other things that sprout up all over the place. <laughs> sure uh, hackberries seem to be bad for me. Oh, um, yeah. Mulberries and walnuts, although mulberries and walnuts kill a little easier than yeah. hackberry and elm just come up from root suckers like crazy. If, it, it's it's, it's right. kind of frustrating, but it's also kind of nice to chop down a bunch of them, get a good, good uh, okay. brush pile burning. Why don't we go ahead and do yeah. our emails? We'll okay. A few more emails. Oh, all yeah. right. Uh, Pete from Arlington Heights uh, had a question about tomatillos. Uh, he's tried raise, raising tomatillo plants for a few years without much success. Plants it along with the tomato plants. It gets really big but bears almost no fruit until and, and, and what that does is very late in the season. Uh, he's heard that you need two plants to get good yields. Um, I don't know that that's, no, that, that that's yeah, a consideration. I've never heard that. Um, <laughs> it just has a long growing season. I think, season, I think maybe yeah, uh, like <laughs> if you can get them, get them going somehow earlier than the, start them maybe with the peppers mm -hmm. so that they have another couple of weeks to, to, to grow the plants before you put them out because they come up as volunteers in the mm -hmm. garden and, and make abundant fruit. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know um, if, if it's in full sun yes. and you get them out, a, a fairly good sized plant that's about ready to bloom. And when you plant it out, uh, you, you should have success with them. So keep trying and, and just try to get it going a little sooner. Yeah. Okay, good idea. And Marty? Maybe you could plant them now. Start them from seed. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. We have, um, we have a viewer who is interested in trying to grow his own tea. Tea doesn't typically grow here in central United States, but has a heated greenhouse, trying to keep it alive in winter. So even the harsh winters, like the one where temperatures dip, you know, he can still keep the greenhouse maybe 45 to 52 degrees at night. Would we recommend any particular variety? And do we have any tips about growing one? Michael, I've never known anybody who wanted to grow tea in Illinois <laughs> before, but I would be delighted for you to give it a spin and let us know how it works. Um, we were talking, we didn't have time for this question a couple weeks ago, but we were talking about it around the table before the show started. And it's just such a, it's such a different idea. Nobody had any ideas about varieties. I, I'm thinking well, green, it, it, it's, it's, green it's a camellia, so yeah. if, you know, people are, have camellias yeah. that they overwinter uh, up here in the north and they flower nicely. So you'd, you'd think uh, Camellia sinensis would have similar requirements, mm -hmm. and go. as far as, as cultivars, because we're so far away from where you grow it, yeah, it, it, you'd probably be lucky to find just a, a, a species plant, okay. a family <laughs> right. as go opposed for it. to have some uh, fun. That's yeah. why I was yeah. wondering. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. that's a great part of it, gardening. Actually, just have yeah. some fun. They're and you actually, had a question. Oh, you I was going to add to the tea question. There actually is a, a North American tea plantation near Charleston, South Carolina. It's the only place in North America that grows tea, oh. and I got to see it. A few years ago, <laughs> so you might talk to them and see what or their a field trip. Or my a field word. trip goes <laughs> <Look at> <laughs> um, But my email, really quick, is a houseplant ID. This person has had this houseplant for three years, and they have no idea. They've looked online and can't find the the ident identity of it. Um, it. When she bought it, it had tiny pink flowers, and they have not returned. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got waxy leaves, and this, the plant seems to want no to grow out outwards yeah. and they sent this picture and that is a kalanchoe mm -hmm. and that is really what it looks like if you're growing it in not enough light mm -hmm. so it wants really really <laughs> bright yeah. window bright light usually brighter than what you have in your house naturally um, you can try to cut it back 
and give it a really good bright location this summer. Mm -hmm. And it is one that reacts to long um, nights. So about October, um, if you put it undisturbed, okay. it will bloom again for you. 14 mm -hmm. hour nights. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And we did have a caller on line three. Uh, Elaine, do you have a really, really quick question? Or maybe we'll answer it real quick. For Cynthia, when do you prune them? After they after bloom. They after they bloom. For Cynthia, after they bloom. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elaine. And we want to make sure that everybody <laughs> thinks about our podcast that's coming up here very soon. Diane Nolan is going to be on it. If you have any questions for Diane, make sure that you email those to us or connect with us on Facebook. And I'm really excited about that. And thank you all. Have a great week gardening. I know I'm looking forward to looking through those garden catalogs. Thank you very much.